Welcome to the More Perfect Union, the podcast that offers real debate without the hate. Sponsored by BetterHelp.com. I'm Kevin Kelton, along with my friends, Greg Matusak. Thank you. And this week, if anyone has any extra GameStop shares or stocks, I would love to have them. <laughs> That's <it>. and, <laughs> and Ward Anderson. I know you don't like me. I don't care. <laughs> Stop a, reading my thoughts. <laughs> a little sensitive tonight. <laughs> I thought you finally got into my email cache. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about what's in the news this week, shall we? Myanmar, which used to be Burma, I believe, is undergoing apparently a military coup right now. And if you watch CNN, you would never know this. Myanmar had an election in 2020 in November. And the democratically elected government won re-election by a massive amount. And the military didn't like that very much since apparently back in 2015, up until 2015, the military was running the country. So the guy who's the leader of the military just said, you know what, we're not going to let them start the new government. And he started rounding up the president of the country. They don't call her a president, but whatever she is and some other government officials. So the reason that I bring that up is not because I care so much about Myanmar, but that it's um, going into the impeachment trial, which starts a week from tomorrow. It's a reminder of what could have happened here. I think that we're getting a little cavalier in this country thinking that, oh, January 6th was just a one-off. It was a lot of people with bad intentions who had met online, but you know what? Everything turned out fine. Yes, we lost a few people passed away, but and there was some damage to the capital. But hey, everything's cool. Well, it it's not because we don't know how close we came to being another Myanmar. It's just a uh, it's just a testament to how well our system works that we didn't go in that direction, but we could have. It's it's just that we don't have quite the amount of radicals in play. Now, that's not to say we couldn't be in the same situation four years or eight years from now if things were to continue along this path. You know, the the police that day showed incredible, incredible restraint in not drawing weapons. There was one person shot, that person died. Um, but there were other places in the Capitol where police specifically did not draw weapons and did not try to overpower those people because they figured if, if, you know, I might get one or two of them and then they're going to kill me. If that had happened and bloodshed had started being spilled in different parts of the Capitol that day, it's very possible. Listen, I believe that many of those people brought, brought guns into the Capitol in their backpacks or on their person. That day could have gone so bad in so many ways. If they had come across Nancy Pelosi or AOC or or Steny Hoyer and marched them out of the Capitol and put them on their knees and maybe hogtied them with, with plastic handcuffs, what would have happened when they went back in there and people had to really think, how do I vote on the next vote knowing what just happened outside? We came so freaking close that people don't realize how bad it could have been. And that's why I wanted to, to bring up this topic. And, you know, next week, there's going to be this, this impeachment trial. And for all intents and purposes, we can I- I predict the outcome of it. But with time, we're losing the reality of what almost happened that day and how bad it was and why that man should pay a huge penalty for what he did. He sent 40,000 Americans to march on the Capitol. Now, he will make a defense. He will say, at some point, I said, do it peacefully. Let's be patriotic. But he sent 40,000 people to march on Congress, which has, you know, 525 people, plus their aides, plus some police officers. He sent 40,000 people to march on them. And I also think that, that people forget in this mob mentality, 
for those that are talking about like, you know, most of the people there didn't plan anything. They were caught up in the moment. That's mob mentality. And I agree with that. I do believe that of the tens of thousands that were there, that many of them had no intention, no ill intent, no intention of violence, no intention of destruction, but mob mentality takes over and it does change people and it makes people react a certain way. Now imagine if a congressperson had been grabbed and held and tied up. Now imagine mob mentality taking over. And that's the thing is we got lucky it didn't get to that. But I can tell you, I bet if someone, if a congressperson had been captured, you would have seen this escalate further. We just got lucky they didn't. That's my point. Greg? So what's interesting is, we're talking already slightly about next week and about the impeachment hearing. Five members of Trump's defense team have quit in the past couple of days because supposedly, if you read the gossip columns like I do. It's, <laughs> it's not gossip. I know what you're going to say. It's not gossip. <laughs> is, that they, is that Trump refuses to budge from his, his strategy of he wants it to go on a, a strategy of that it's all about campaign election reform yeah that it he, was- he, he wants to no, he wants to argue that the, the the election was indeed fixed yep you know it was stolen and he yep. wants that to be his defense they wanted to make a constitutional defense and yep. their their client said no this is the defense i want and and yep. he's and they're like look you're gonna lose it he's like nope if it's not this way it's and they're like okay we're we're gonna just pay our bill validate our parking and we'll leave now he's got two guys who, who are pretty much scumbags. And I think that's a legal term. Um, and, <laughs> and they're, they're like, their hope is that they are just going to push for the, that this impeachment is unconstitutional. And that's, no, 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 just, that's, that's the defense that he rejected. No, that's the one he should be using. Maybe I think people also miss the point of this. I really do. I hear people saying all the time, they're not going to convict him, so why bother? They're not going to convict him, so why bother? And the thing I keep coming back to is doing the right thing isn't about necessarily getting the results that you want, but showing that you're doing the right thing anyway. And if the truth comes out and a lot of really incriminating, crazy, awful stuff is revealed in testimony during an impeachment trial, that's a good thing even if there's not a conviction that comes from it, because maybe it will educate some of the Americans who are in the middle a little bit on the fence a little bit, kind of don't really get it. Kind of not, you know, whatever. I want more transparency. You know, I have said this many times. I've lost money. I've lost friends and I've lost jobs, but I've never lost sleep by doing the right thing. And that's what Congress should be about doing the right thing. Spike Lee stole that from me, by the way. Yeah. And I want to jump in and just say, you know, Greg hates it when I kind of take Trump's side on something. No, no, I'm all for it. You know, I I stand second to no one in my absolute animosity towards this man. But in this case, I kind of think that he's probably doing for what for him, he's making not the smart move, but he's making a calculated move because you know they can they can make the argument that uh, it's unconstitutional to uh, impeach an ex president. They're going to win this case anyway. So the the only question is how many Republican votes Trump loses. Right now he's at negative five, at least with the last vote, which was over the constitutionality. He wants to take this national spotlight, five days of the entire country watching on CNN and Fox, and MSNBC, and on ABC, and CBS. He wants to take all of that and turn it back on him again in a good way. He wants to use that time to make the argument he couldn't make between November 3rd and January 6th, which was the election was stolen from me. There was uh, phony votes were cast in his favor. Votes from of mine were not counted. It was a it was a sham election. I should be your president. He wants to make that case publicly, and he wants to use this forum to make it because he couldn't make it in front of the Supreme Court, and he couldn't make it in front of the Congress. 
What's the worst that happens? Right now, he's at negative five votes. What does he go? He loses 58 votes in the Senate. He loses 60 votes in the Senate. The Democrats aren't getting 67 to convict him. So what does he care? Well, and on top of that, impeachment is not a criminal trial. You know, it's every once in a while I have someone come up and go, well, you know, due process and they have to blow and there has to. And I go, this isn't a criminal trial. I heard someone this week kept saying, this is nothing but political. I go, yes, impeachment is a political process. It isn't a criminal trial. That's why I say Democrats go for it and show, do the right thing. Because anyway, you look at this, Trump personally, maybe not Republicans, but Trump will personally gain from it. He will not be hurt by this. Okay, so let's move on to other stuff that's happening in the news or has happened no, in the news. This no, week. Kevin. No, Kevin. <laughs> the GameStop versus Robin Hood. I guess it wasn't GameStop. It was really Wall Street versus Reddit. And Robin Hood and GameStop were just kind of like innocent bystanders in this. So it happened. Uh, it's now happening with a couple of other stocks. I think tomorrow's going to be very interesting to see what happens, not only with GameStop, but with American Airlines and BlackBerry and a couple of other stocks. Greg, what's your take on this whole thing? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Or should we even care? It's funny because I don't think there's any good guys. And I don't think there's any bad guys. I know everyone hates on hedge fund and big business. But the only thing that I like about that is there was a story I read where a nine-year-old boy for Kwanzaa last year, his grandmother gave him 10 shares of GameStop stock because it was something he liked. And uh, he sold it this uh, this past week for thirty two hundred dollars. Good for him. That was the best thing that so, happened. So a me, Christmas miracle, a Kwanzaa miracle. <laughs> so let me jump oh, in sorry. here. You know, I've had a lot of conversations on Facebook and in Open Fire with people who think that um, this is bad for everybody. That the Reddit people are being jerks. Blah blah blah. I see it a little differently, which is this: people have always assumed that in any market investors or or consumers of that market will make rational choices based on purely economic dynamics, purely economic indicators, like the value of a company, its long-term potential, what's happening in the news with that company. But there are other reasons that people do things with money that aren't necessarily about investment and risk and return. For instance, If I go to a movie and I go with Jessica and we drop $30 on two tickets, I've lost $30, but I got enjoyment out of that two hours, right? The people that were on Reddit said, you know what would be fun is I'm going to take $30 or $40 and buy a share of GameStop. And if everybody does that, we might be able to drive the price up and screw over these hedge funds that are betting that the price is going to go down. And they were willing to lose that 30 or 40 bucks for the entertainment value of what happened. And in fact, they were successful because going back to what we were talking about at the top of the show, there's power in numbers. And that's what this episode, if there's, if it has a theme, that's what I hope that theme is. So here you know, what happened in the Capitol on January 6th, I, I you know, abhorred, but I'm likening it to this, which is something that I kind of, <laughs> I kind of enjoyed, but they both have that same thing. It's, it's people who feel disenfranchised saying, screw the powers that be, I'm taking charge and I'm going to show them that I've got power too. In this case, it wasn't with handcuffs and weapons and hockey sticks. It was with Dollars, And they put it to, to a couple of hedge funds, specifically Melvin Capital, who had shorted this stock. They drove up the price. Melvin Capital had uh, shorts come due on a certain day. I believe they came due either on Friday or they're coming due on Monday when this podcast drops. And they're going to be in the hole for billions of dollars. Now, I don't know how big a company Melvin Capital is. Maybe they'll be able to right the ship and move on. Maybe it'll just be a bad month in the life of this company. But there was enjoyment. There was satisfaction garnered by millions of people who stuck it to the man. And even if they lose some money on their investment, they're okay with that because they got a different satisfaction. 
Well, you know, before when we were talking about impeachment, and we said sometimes you do the right thing even if you don't gain from it, all right? That also goes with this. Mm -hmm. There are people out there who are willing to lose in order to get their message across and to stick it to someone else, okay? Now, we can agree with that or we can disagree with that, but that's the message that was being sent. It's very easy to hate on Wall Street. Because much like when I was talking about Trump before, or we were talking about the insurrection, Wall Street for the longest time, for as long as I can remember, has never had any consequences. Because of the the huge crash in the 20s, we now bail them out all the time. We don't want to repeat this. And you know, we saw this in the last bailout that Wall Street went back to acting like nothing had ever happened. They got bailed out by the government and acted like nothing had changed and there were no consequences. It's one thing to just say you buy stocks in a company, you hope they go up, whatever you sell, you buy, you hold on to it, you retire. Okay. But the game of Wall Street, where there's all this ability to manipulate it, change it, screw around with it and have so many players involved manipulating it to make more money, lose money, blah, blah, blah. That's the shit that I can't stand. It should be something which it was originally intended to be. It should be the ability for the public to own part of a company and to use that to control, to have their own money, their own income, to retirement, whatever. It's all of that that I hate. And that's the part of me that loves this is watching normal people manipulate the system in a way that people who are insiders have been able to do forever. Oh, I agree. I agree. And I, I'm hoping that, you know, with a Democratic administration, that there'll be some pressure uh, on the Justice Department and the SEC to look at ways to, to rein in some of this speculative manipulation that these hedge funds have been getting away with for way too long. And by the way, at, at highly reduced tax rates as well. Uh, moving on, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has been in the news a lot more than I think she should be this week. It's a topic that, frankly, I'm not thrilled that we should bring up because I think we're just making her famous and turning her into a cause celeb, but she is in the news and it's hard to ignore. So with that again, Greg, I'm going to throw to you first. What's your take on how the Republican Party should deal with her and how the media should deal with her? Okay, those are that's two different questions. So it's like we get rid of uh, Representative Steve King and uh, now we got her. And it's like even worse. Uh, if if you haven't been following the, the Rep Green, Taylor Green issues, she's been it's it's come out that she has said terrible horrible things night the 9-11 was actually a hoax uh sandy hook tragedy was a hoax um she said that uh that there's jewish lasers in space that i mean and 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 she's serious when she says that she follows okay, all she these never QAnon said conspiracies. That. For, the, for those that don't know she didn't actually say jewish lasers no she, she didn't we got at least let, well, let's not was, what let's was, not go what was her exact what was her i'm not glad, saying hold I'm on glad. i'm not go saying ahead. that what she said wasn't batshit crazy but everyone has turned this into jewish lasers and and we we shouldn't belittle it by going to the extreme with that okay because because then we're falling into this trend. no 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 right. okay oh, no i want to i want to i want to build on that greg you know you had the floor and we're going to return it to you i'm not filibustering no no here. correct me that's Sorry. cool but, but and i'm not correcting you i'm not correcting you no. but but ward brought up something you know we sometimes think alike ward brought up exactly what i was going to say which is that i've been watching this story now since wednesday or thursday and the the whole laser thing and it's progressed to where like bill Maher is going she said that the wildfires in California were, were caused by Jewish lasers. And then he said, I'm not kidding here. Well, yes, you are, Bill, because that's not what she said. And now everybody is saying it, and it's wrong. And the reason that we have to flag it is because it makes Democrats look bad because we're a accusing her of saying something she did not say. And the Republicans are going to look at what she did say and go, look at those Democrats. It's fake news. They made up this thing about Jewish lasers. Yeah, yeah. What she said was, and she is factually right about what happened. 
in about 2005 or 2009, PG&E, which is the uh, public utility in California, put some satellites in space to harness solar energy, and the technology was then going to beam them using microwaves down to the plants on the ground to get that energy out to the customers. Her theory, which I think is batshit crazy, is that these microwaves, she called them lasers, but they're microwaves, missed their target and sparked a fire. Okay. There's no science behind that. But the point is what she's saying about those those satellites being up in space is indeed accurate. And then she said, you know, they were paid for by blah, 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 blah. And she mentioned the Rothschilds, which is a buzzword in the Jewish community for anti-Semitism, just like George Soros is a buzzword for anti-Semitism. So those things got conflagrated into (laughs) Jewish lasers. (laughs) But well, we have enough to criticize her for accurately without going into hyperbole and then making us look like the fools. Well, that's what I mean. It's what she said was batshit crazy. So I'm not in any way defending her or dismissing that. But okay. we do our own argument a disservice when we try to reduce it to the basest insult that we can. Well, it's like turning but, everything into a racism argument when sometimes things are, are, they have race involved in them, but they're not racist. It's the same thing. Right. I said this also about Trump injecting bleach i go okay he didn't use the word bleach we 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 just have to be specific about this and the reason i say that is because the moment when it comes to dealing with right-wing media and right-wing response if you deviate from the quote they'll use that against you exactly that's exactly my point and so by saying Jewish lasers, people will go, she never said Jewish lasers. And she didn't. Now, obviously, she was making the insinuation that Jews caused the wildfire because of their, you know, a uh, monetary funding, thing. Their yeah, funding right. of this thing and blah, blah. So, yes, if you want to get down to it, she's saying the Jews did this with their lasers. Okay, fine. But we do ourselves a disservice when we when we make that jump to that, okay? Because, like I said, we give right wing media this ammunition to then go. She never said that. She never said that. She never said that. So the point is that there's a there's a bill that wants to get her expelled from Congress, okay? And a lot of Democrats have signed on. I, I don't know how many how much legs this will get, but none. Yeah, to be quite honest, it's one of those things where the people who elected her knew what they were getting. They knew they were getting. And this is the same thing with Rep. Steve King. They knew what they were getting with him. He kept a uh, Confederate flag on his desk and he was from Iowa. Um, (laughs) I'm not kidding on that one either. I know. know. (laughs) Um, Which is why when you said he had controversies, that's fine. He could have stayed in his seat forever and he would have, I mean, he could have, he said terrible things and they knew what they were getting. The Republican response to this though, was that they put her on the education committee. Yeah. And, and if you ask a Republican, like, Hey, what do you think about some of these terrible things? She berated a victim, a a school shooting victim walking down the street. They're like, well, We can't control everything they did before they became, you know, I don't know about that. That's a terrible answer. We threw out Al Franken for something he did 20 years before he became a senator. I mean, honestly, you know, their moral guide is terrible. She attacked David Hogg. Right. A Parkland shooter survivor. But here's the thing. David Hogg is considered an enemy by much of the Republican Party. So we can think that's horrible that she attacked him all we want. But I can tell you that a majority of the Republican Party doesn't think that way. Yeah. And the other thing about uh, Green 
is, again, I think that this week we've turned her into a cause celeb. And I, I said to some people, I hope you're happy with all of this righteous indignation because all you're doing is creating their version of AOC. And everybody jumped on me and said, oh, please, AOC, she's a fine woman and she's smart and she means well, whereas Marjorie Taylor Greene is this jerk who believes in space lasers and she hates you know, school shooting victims and everything. And this is what bothers me about my side. This is when Democrats, and I am a a loyal, lifelong Democrat, this is when I lose patience with my side because I think that too, and you think that, but that doesn't mean that they think that. They see her as the moderate rational person. They see AOC as the socialist communist who wants to destroy the country. So when you get to that point of like, oh, but our radical is smart and good, and their radical is evil and stupid, then you're not in a discussion anymore. So I was just going to say, all we've done this week is we've created a post-Trump hero in the Republican Party. And I think we've done ourselves a disservice, not a service. I agree with that. I just wanted to say they don't even care when their people say crazy things or don't even care if they're smart or moderate or whatever. They love it when they piss off liberals. And the more we talk about her and the more we seem pissed about her, they like that. They don't give a shit if she's wrong or not. They love the fact that we care. That's what they give a shit about. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's like if you're if you break up with someone, you don't want them to know that what they're doing, who they're seeing bothers you. That just makes things worse. So anyways, uh speaking of speaking of batshit crazy, which is a phrase we used a few times, uh we should talk about how to not be batshit crazy, which is to to use the services of our lovely sponsor betterhelp.com. And and that's the best segue I can come up with for this for this ad read. <laughs> smooth. Smooth. So as, as our listeners know, betterhelp.com has been um, supporting us and sponsoring us now for several weeks and will continue to do so. And we want to welcome them back because they are the online therapy website that asks the pertinent question, what is interfering with your happiness other than Marjorie Taylor Greene? Is it something that's preventing you from achieving your goals, like getting her out of Congress? <laughs> no. Well, whatever is, is troubling you in your world, be it politics, be it your home life, be it your you know problems at work, be it just problems with self-esteem, betterhelp.com is the online therapy website that can match you with your own licensed professional therapist and connect you within you know mere hours to someone that you can talk to and seek advice from. Right, uh, Ward? Well, I mean, you don't have to go to an office. You don't have to go and seek somebody out. You can connect in a safe and private online environment. It's convenient. You can start communicating with your therapist in under 24 hours. That's better than most health plans will offer you. Right. Especially it's better than like 25 hours. Um, (laughs) Additionally, if you lost, (laughs) I'm, I'm working on my math skills. And additionally, if you lost your shirt, Like if you're a hedge fund guy and you put all your money and then it's affordable and wait for it for all you other hedge fund guys, uh, financial aid is available. Yeah. And, and seriously, no, they do have really good professional therapists who are licensed and specialize in areas such as depression, anger, stress management, family conflicts, anxiety, dealing with grief, relationships, self-esteem, sleeping matters, LGBTQ matters, and trauma. So no matter you know what it is that's bothering you, they have an expert who is well prepared to you know go down this journey with you and see if you can't alleviate some of the, the stresses in your life. And anything you share is confidential. So if you want to start living a happier life today, give it a try. And Ward, how can they do that? Well, as a more perfect union listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash more perfect. That's betterhelp.com slash more perfect. 
Yes, join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash more perfect. So, Greg, uh, one topic that I came into this show really wanting to discuss with you was your state senator, Rob Portman. Uh, He's not your (laughs) state senator. He's a a U.S. senator from your state who you have spoken about on this show before, and he uh, he made a little news this week. What's going on there? What a piece of shit. Okay, what's wrong on the end? High in the middle? (laughs) Ohio. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Rob Portman, who, if anyone's listened to the show more than once, probably has heard me call him a piece of shit, um, knows what? how much I dislike him. Yeah, what? Rob Portman, when Trump was elected, Rob Portman said, you know, I'm going I'm going to be that that effect, that mild effect on him. I'm going to rein him back in. And a couple of days ago, he said he was not running for reelection. And that was kind of upsetting for a lot of us because we really thought Rob, the Senator Portman needed, you know, to get his medicine to finally get like not elected. He needed to run that race and hear from voters about what a lousy job he did uh, for the last four years, at least, but even before that, but at least the last four years, he betrayed Ohioans and pretty much America on how every time he went with Trump, he kept ignoring all the terrible things. And it was a real disservice. And he happens to be one of the 10 Republican senators who came up with a compromise plan uh, this weekend that they proposed to the White House to try to come to some type of a bipartisan agreement over a COVID relief bill. Now, for those of you who follow the news, you probably already heard about this. The Biden administration had put forward a $1.9 billion package. These senators, thank you, a $1.9 trillion package, Greg is right. And these senators paired it back to about $600 billion by changing some ideas here and there. We don't need to go into those details now unless you guys want to. But I'm curious as to whether you think the Democrats should take this olive branch and go with that package, try to negotiate something between the two, or they should hold out for a much more robust package, which would mean passing it through reconciliation. I just want to say my thing in all of this is, and Canada has dropped the ball as well. Listeners who regularly listen know that I'm American. I live in Canada. Canada's dropped the ball. The U.S. has dropped the ball. The point is North America is incredibly wealthy. Okay, it can afford to do this. The thing that's driving me crazy about COVID-19 is that if we would just spend the money and shut things down and struggle through it, we would get through it. What you're seeing is the countries that have done the best with COVID-19 are the ones that shut everything down, were very strict, and they got through it. America and Canada. They have the money to do this. It seems that when it comes to the ever the average everyday person and the average citizen and some kind of a catastrophe like a pandemic, suddenly we start going, where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? We don't question these things when it comes to an attack on the country or some kind of a military thing we need to do or whatever. We have the money. Spend the money, shut things down, take care of the people, get through the pandemic. Period. Okay. okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna take issue here and I'm gonna go out on a on a kind of a contrarian view. Two Kevin, things. you ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, uh, you know, I personally would like to see the one point nine trillion dollar uh, proposal become law. But that said, there's there's some good about what's happening now. The Republican Party over the last four years got away from whatever core ideals they had. And I never particularly accepted their core ideals as politically right, but at least they had principles. And one of them was being fiscal conservatives. I think it's a good thing right now that Republicans are going back to that as a rallying point, even though it's stopping us from achieving our goal which is to infuse as much money into the economy as needed to get through COVID relief. Because again, the Republican Party, in my opinion, has been lost for four or five years. They've lost their ideals. 
I think it would be better to see them coalesce around what used to be their core principles, which would kind of help help them excise Trumpism. Greg, you had something to say. Yeah, you know what? I, I agree completely. And this is the thing that drives me nuts about Portman. Uh, is that, you know, for four years, he was like, oh, boy, I'm going to be that voice of reason in the room with Trump. And he wasn't. And you're right. They should be fiscally conservative. And yet they spent money like it was going out of style. And now three weeks in, they're like, you know what? I know there's like 4000 people dying every day. But uh, I think we really should think about money. Now we should think about money. Literally, I I just saw on the TV there were three Republican governors who were complaining. They waited until two weeks after Trump left office, and they were like, I'm not really happy with the federal rollout of the vaccine. And and someone was like, well, do you take account with uh, the Trump administration? They're like, Trump's not in office. This is Biden's fault. (laughs) And and they were like, well, but Biden has Biden. And they were like, no, this is Biden's fault. He needs to fix this now. And everyone was like, what the hell? And it's great that they are fiscally conservative. But where were they fiscally conservative? I don't know, a month ago. OK, where were they fiscally? This is I mean, well, we're so, in agreement. Yeah, we're in agreement. Yeah. And then there's one other point I wanted to add. A lot of Democrats and especially on the very progressive liberal side are saying, this is the problem. We try to get bipartisanship and then we get watered down legislation that does nothing. Democrats should hold the line. They've got their 50 votes plus Kamala Harris as vice president would be a 50, uh, you know, vote number 51. They should push this through, through reconciliation. Now we're political wonks. I think the three of us understand what that means. I don't think that a lot of (laughs) Democrats really understand. Do you remember In about 2017 or 2018, there was a big vote on doing away with the ACA, doing away with Obamacare. And there was a dramatic moment late, late at night in the Senate when the Republicans had 52 votes if they all stuck together at that point in time. Susan Collins had voted against it and Lisa Murkowski had voted against it. And John McCain came to the floor. And he was the make or break vote. And everybody remembers that moment because it was, it's iconic now. He put his thumb in in the air and then he went thumbs down and he voted against it. Even Democrats loved John McCain at that moment. Well, do you know why he was voting against it? Because the Republicans were going to do exactly what the Democrats want to do now. Instead of going through what they call in the Senate regular order, which means using the rules of the filibuster to demand 60 votes to pass legislation. The Republicans tried to do that with 50 votes, plus Mike Pence's if they had needed him. And McCain said, not that I don't agree with doing away with Obamacare, because he did. He said, this is not the way to do it. We should be doing this through regular order. And now it's Republicans who are saying that, and it's Democrats who are saying screw regular order, you know, let's use our power to get this passed any way we want. First of all, it's not going to happen because Joe Manchin isn't going to vote for, with Democrats. So even if you think that's the way to go, Democrats, you're living in a fantasy world because Joe Manchin is a Democratic senator and he won't vote for that $1.9 trillion budget. So what are you going to do? I know you say that, but I think there Solid. are there's one or two Republicans who want to be reelected in the next two years who are like, oh, once again, 1.9 versus 600. And that's great. And I know people, there are wonks, but the only thing that's more important than like, I don't know, that whole great moments and great speeches is results. And right now, 1.9 trillion, well, that gets you results. So what you're saying is, is you think that they could pass it through reconciliation because even if they lose match and they'll get one or two Republican votes. Yes. And okay. I think guys like Ben Sass. I think um, I think Collins at this point, Murkowski, even even uh, not Collins because she signed up for that six hundred billion. And but Murkowski I think, did too. They're not going to they're not going to get those two votes. I don't we, think. Then, then Romney, we'll get one or two. But I'm telling you, um, there are people who are who are thinking, look, I need to get relief to my peoples, and this is the way to do it. You know, there are governors who are screaming like, we need help. 
unemployment is not exactly going down on its own. People need heat. People need water. Uh, people need uh, apartments. I you can know? tell you this. When we look back at the Spanish flu, we look back at 1918, and we look back at major crises, people do not look back and talk about the money that was spent. They look back and they talk about how quickly we recovered, how quickly people were helped, how quickly we moved on. And in the end, that's going to be looking forward in the history books. That's going to be what people remember about this. They're not going to remember how much money was spent. They're going to remember how quickly we recovered and we came out of it. We can argue all we want about how much we're spending, but history will look back at how quickly we bounce back. And then finally this week, uh, you know, we've been talking about national politics and in the case of Myanmar, international politics. But we rarely touch on local politics these days. But uh, I wanted to touch on local politics because we've been talking now about Democrats versus Republicans and, you know, attempts at bipartisanship. Of course, we know that the country is harshly divided over partisan divides. But there is one place where bipartisanship has proven truly effective recently, and it's in Los Angeles, California. And it's bipartisanship around the topic of corruption, because the Los Angeles City Council has a new corruption scandal that has ensnarled both Republicans and Democrats, and it's a freaking doozy. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should go Google it, because this is corruption old style, where they're not only taking cash in bathrooms, and they're not only taking poker chips in return for political favors, but they're taking hookers. (laughs) This scandal apparently started breaking in 2017, where these guys, you know, there's a there's some developer, some billionaire Chinese developer who wanted to to get involved in some projects that were being developed with under the auspices of the city. And they went to these councilmen to get meetings, to get introduced to the people that were deciding who to give the contracts to, and a guy named uh, Mitch Anglinger, a councilman, a Republican councilman, city councilman in Los Angeles, pled guilty and has now been sentenced to uh, a fairly long prison sentence. This guy took $10,000 and $1,000 in poker chips in a hotel room, plus he accepted $5,000 on a separate occasion in a bathroom in Vegas. Plus, he was part of some group who accepted the wiping out of $34,000 in bar tabs, $34,000 in bar tabs. And he went back to his room with a hooker that was provided by this businessman, or as as they call him in, in Vegas, an escort. This guy admitted to it and he got caught. Now, that's a Republican. There's also a Democrat named Jose I'm not going to pronounce his last name right. H-U-I-Z-A-R. Pronounce it however you like. And another guy named Curran Price and another guy named Herb Wesson. They're either current or former councilmen. They're also, you know, the FBI got <laughs> got the goods on them. And they're, you know, in the process of going through the courts now. So for those people, it's alleged corruption. Legally, I guess we have to say they're innocent until proven guilty. But most of them are going down. And... In the case of this one fella, Huzar or Hizar, I mean, we're talking about almost a million dollars in in kickbacks that this guy accepted. This is just in one city, and this is what was caught. Our system is corroded with this kind of corruption, and we need to get back to trying to root that stuff out. So you say that, but we had three city in Cincinnati. I mean, it's not a contest. Um, okay. And I'm, I'm just saying uh, we had three city council members arrested on um, a corruption, I believe, in the past couple months. Um, and one was uh, the front runner to be mayor. I think two Democrats and one Republican. So, yeah, I think they're taking this stuff more seriously. Um, one of them I've 
kind of knew pretty well. Um, and I've heard some of the evidence and um, it was, they were getting really, really strict. Uh, it wasn't that much money. He didn't go home with an escort. It wasn't bank chips. It was one of those, uh, someone gave him some money and said, uh, so you'll be voting for us. And he's like, I, I've always voted for your company. And they were like, okay, wink. And he was like, is something in your eye? And they were like, wink. <laughs> so yeah, I I'm, I'm glad local and city council people are being held now. And I love these things. Um, and I'm glad that they look at Democrats and Republicans. Um, so good. This is why I love living in Canada. Because our scandals here are like, my opponent says that this two-way street should be named after Wayne Gretzky, but I say it should be named after Gordon Lightfoot. (laughs) (laughs) And outrage ensues for weeks. Oh my God. Until they name it Gretzky Lightfoot Boulevard. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the kind of bipartisanship I wish we could achieve in this country. Gretzky Lightfoot Boulevard. (laughs) With that, we want to thank everybody for listening. If you enjoy what we do here, please follow us on Twitter at MPU Podcast and on Instagram at MPU Fan Club. And please share our link on your Facebook timeline. Really, we want to build up our listeners and anything you can do to help us. If you like our show, Please, please tell your friends to listen to us. If you don't like our show, then why are you still here? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is going to be the highlight of the week that leads up to the anticipated impeachment trial? Um, I see that uh, I might run for city council because there's tons of spots available. Um <laughs> <laughs> And, ju- and Jurassic Hunt. What's going on with that? Yeah. <laughs> Triassic Hunt. Triassic Hunt. Triassic yeah. Hunt. My movie with the people that made Sharknado is now available to stream, to rent, to own. Oh, please do, because uh, Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs>